Hello everyone, it is the summer holidays, summer 2021. I'm going to do a little bit of reading. This is a book from our library, recommended by Miss Jermak, our librarian. It's got two books in one. I'm going to go to Dolphin Song because I love dolphins and one of my dreams is to swim with dolphins. And I know I'm going to get there, so here we go. If you want to read the book in September, come to the library. So it's Dolphin Song, Lawrence and John. For my godson Francis, who is not quite old enough to read this book, but who loves dolphins and sharks with big teeth. That's her dedication. And here's a bit of a map to start us off of Dugong Island. And there's Dolphin Bay, we can see. So we might have to come back to this map to get ourselves um, uh, really into the story. But I love this at the bottom right-hand corner. You can see the directions. North is to the top and south to the bottom and west to the left and east to the right. And this is a great map. Right, let's go, everybody. Let's see how we get into the story. So, chapter one. When a teacher first told the class that they were going on an ocean voyage to see the sardine run, Martine Allen had a funny vision of the silver tomato sauce covered sardines that come in cans, only whole and wearing matching silver trainers, in which they'd sprint along the South African coast. But that wasn't it at all. The sardine run was, Miss Faulkner told them, one of the greatest wildlife spectacles on earth. It was a migration by sea. Every June and July, millions of sardines left their home off the Agulas banks on the west coast of South Africa in pursuit of their main food. The nutrient-rich plankton flowing eastwards on the cold current. The sardines swam after the plankton with their mouths open, gobbling it up as they went. They, in turn, were pursued by tens of thousands of predators, including dolphins, dusky ragged tooth and bronze whaler sharks, and great flocks of cape gannets with fledgling chicks. Joining this caravan would be Martine and her classmates. Miss Faulkner explained that they would follow the sardine run up the KwaZulu-Natal coast before continuing north to Mozambique, where they would help count the population of dugongs. What are dugongs? Martine whispered to Sherilyn Meyer and was told that they were those cute lumpy grey things, you know, sort of like a cross between a hippo and a seal. The old sailors used to think they were mermaids. The whole class was in a fever of excitement at the thought of ten whole days off school in midterm and on a cruise ship, no less. So was Martine until her teacher handed round some notes on the trip. Top of the list of what to pack was? Number one, swimming costume. Martine put up her hand. Excuse me, Miss Faulkner, but why do we need a swimming costume? There was a lot of giggling and Miss Faulkner couldn't resist a smile. It's called a sea voyage because we're going to sea, Martine, she said. There'll be endless opportunities to snorkel, dive, and splash around in the waves. And I don't think we want you swimming without a costume. More laughter. But what if, Martine tried to get the wording right, what if some of us preferred not to swim? Why ever would you not want to get into the water? Asked the surprised Miss Faulkner. The reefs are glorious. Trust me, Martine, once you've swum in the open ocean where the seabed might be as much as half a mile beneath you, we won't be able to keep you out of the water. Somebody else asked a question then, so nobody noticed that the colour had drained from Martine's face and that beneath her desk her knees had started to tremble. That night the sharks came for, Mar for Martine for the first time. They circled her in technicolour nightmares, their deep-set dead eyes on her flapping white limbs as she struck out across ten tempestuous seas. Over the weeks the dreams increased in frequency and intensity to such an extent that Martine became afraid to go to sleep. Two nights before she was due to leave on the school trip, she took the extreme measure of sitting up in bed with a stack of books on her head, so that they'd crash to the floor and wake her if she nodded her off. Unfortunately, by then, she was so exhausted that the third time they toppled, she barely heard them. She simply scooted down in the sheets and gave herself up to the sharks. She was battling to stay afloat and uneaten in, the, in an ocean so icy 
that her limbs felt paralyzed when a disembodied voice cut into her dream. Wakey, wakey, Martine. We'll need to go soon if we want to get to the beach while it's still early. Martine forced herself into consciousness. It was morning and a blurry figure was sitting on the edge of her bed. She blinked and it swam into focus. Her grandmother, dressed as usual in denim jeans but wearing a pale blue shirt instead of her khaki work one with a line in the pocket, was watching her with sharp indigo eyes. How many times have I told you not to sleep with the window open? Gwen Thomas reproached her gently. No wonder you have nightmares. You're freezing. June is winter in Africa, Martine. Try to remember that. Martine struggled to free herself from the cold tentacles of her dream. I was drowning, she said blearily. There were sharks and I couldn't breathe. Of course you were drowning, said Gwen Thomas, leaning forward and briskly shutting out the biting antelope-tinged air. You are all caught up in the blankets, and what are, they, what are these books doing on the floor? Martine disentangled herself and sat up. She didn't want to worry her grandmother by telling her how bad the, the nightmares had become. I was trying to find something good to read. And you thought you'd start with an enthusiast's guide to model railways and the Jeep engine repair handbook? Martine didn't answer. She was too absorbed by the view from her bedroom window. Beneath the thatched eaves, a herd of elephants straggled around the distant waterhole, grey ghosts in the wintry dawn mist. She'd been at Saubona for six months now, and she still couldn't believe she lived on a great game reserve in South Africa. Still got a thrill every single morning when she opened her eyes, propped herself up on one elbow, and looked out over the savannah wilderness she now called home. Those things didn't take away the knot of sadness that had dwelled inside her ever since her mum and dad had died in a New Year's Eve blaze in their Hampshire home in England. But they definitely helped. It helped too that she had a new family. It wasn't a replacement family because no one could ever replace the parents she'd worshipped. But at least she didn't feel so isolated anymore. Along with her grandmother, there was Tendai, the big Zulu who had recently been promoted from tracker to game warden. Tendai taught her bushcraft skills to help her survive the beautiful but deadly African landscape and took her for campfire breakfasts up on the game reserve escarpment. Martina adored Tendai, but she had a very special relationship with his aunt, Grace, an African medicine woman and traditional healer, a Sangoma, who also happened to be the best cook in the world. Grace's ancestors were both African and Caribbean, and she alone knew the secret of Martine's gift with animals and many other secrets besides. Last, and to Martine's mind, most important was her white giraffe, Jeremiah, Jemmy for short. Martine thought of Jemmy, who she tamed and could ride, and Ben the boy who'd helped her rescue the white giraffe when he was stolen as her best friend. Although since Jemmy couldn't talk and Ben was mostly silent, they hadn't actually confirmed that. Sometime today would be nice, Quinn Thomas said pointedly, and Martine remembered that she was supposed to be getting up. She glanced at the bedside clock and stifled a groan. 6 a.m. Sometimes she wished her grandmother was more of a fan of a Sunday, more, Sunday morning lions. Gwyn Thomas saw Martine's expression and her eyes sparkled with amusement. Once those eyes had only ever studied Martine with coolness or hostility. But these days her tanned face was more usually creased in a smile. You must be so excited about leaving on the school trip tomorrow, she said. Ten whole days at sea, ten whole days of history and nature, and I suppose a little adventure. I envy you. I really do. I almost wish I was going with you. Want to swap places? Gwen Thomas laughed. For a minute there, you sounded almost serious, Martine. You are looking forward to it, aren't you? Absolutely, said Martine, with as much conviction as she could muster. She swallowed a yawn. I can't wait. I'm glad to hear it, because you've been looking quite pale recently. You could do with some sea air. Well, I'll see you downstairs in a few minutes. I'm just packing a picnic for our beach walk. See you downstairs, Martine said brightly, but as soon as the door swung shut behind her grandmother, she put her head in her hands and closed her eyes. She knew very well why she was having the shark dreams, and it had nothing to do with sleeping with her window open in winter, getting tangled up in blankets, eating cheese before bedtime, or any of the other things people said caused nightmares. She was getting them because of something that had happened almost exactly a year ago. She and her parents had been on holiday in Cornwall, England. On their last afternoon there, Martine's dad, a doctor, had received an emergency call to help some boys who'd fallen down a cliff. Martine's mum, Veronica, was recovering from a bout of flu and was having an afternoon nap. And her dad had asked Martine if she would mind reading or drawing for a while because he wanted her mum to get plenty of rest. 
But it was a roasting hot day, and after a while Martine was bored and decided that she nipped down to the beach and put her toes in the sea she could be back before her mum woke up. When she got down there, though, the water was so inviting that soon she was up to her knees and then her waist. Then out of nowhere a wave had knocked her flat. It had dragged her along the seabed and she tumbled over and over as if she was in the spin cycle of a washing machine. When she felt certain she would drown, the wave had ejected her forcibly and she'd managed to half swim, half crawl back to the beach. At more or less the same time, a fisherman had pulled in a basking shark. Martine had seen its sinister shape on the sand as she staggered up the beach and somehow the two things had been combined in her mind. The shark and the washing machine wave. Moments later, she was in her mum's arms. Veronica, who had been searching high and low for her, was so ecstatic to see her safe that she forgot to scold her. Not wanting to distress her mum further, Martina thought it best not to mention the wave and how she'd nearly drowned, although she did vow to herself that she would never again swim in the sea if she could help it. None of that mattered until now, because they'd left Cornwall the next day and her parents had died before they could have another seaside holiday. As a result, nobody had found out about the one thing Martine had never confessed to another living soul, because she didn't even want to admit it to herself. She was petrified of deep water. So uh, that's quite interesting. I'm really enjoying that first chapter. First of all, I was born in South Africa, been to the ocean a lot. Where I was born was called Port Elizabeth. You could, uh, I mean, the beach, there was a beach there, so the sea was amazing. And I love dolphins. But sharks, the interesting thing was, I think when I was very little, there there was a famous movie called Jaws. And it was so scary. And my dad took me to see it. And after that, every time I got in a swimming pool, I thought there was a shark. Um, but then, um, a story for another time, I actually went swimming with sharks, which scuba diving with sharks, which was really amazing and helped me to feel much, much better about that. Um, but it's just so interesting, just reading the book and feeling like I'm back in South Africa on a game reserve, been to quite a few game reserves, Kruger National Park and um, different ones in, in South Africa, but especially the Kruger National Park. But they're amazing, those game reserves and the animals and just the open nature. And this is what's amazing about reading. We can just get totally into a different place in the world. We can go on an adventure. I was reading now on the on the sofa, go on an adventure South Africa is thousands and thousands of miles from England, from where we're sitting in London, and I could go on an adventure there through my reading. So I really enjoyed that. Going to try and maybe do a bit more, but you know where this book is. As soon as we get back to school in September, you can go get it for yourself from the Grange Library.